Dear people watching and listening, Assalamu alaikum. Kindly like and share this video with your friends and family and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Kindly support me through my Patreon so that I can keep making such videos. A kind reminder that the link to the combat kit is in the description below. Start of Chapter 4 Test of Inspiration Christian missionaries are very fond of repeating the following verse from the writings of St. Paul. St. Paul happens to be the most prolific of all authors of the Christian Bible. He has authored more than 50% of the books and epistles of the New Testament, to be exact, 14 out of the 27. In his self-professed inspiration, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, Chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is Paul's second personal letter to his protege, Timothy. Do you remember Paul advising Timothy in his first epistle? Drink no longer water, but choose a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. 1 Timothy, chapter 5, verse 23. Now Paul is giving Timothy a more sanguine, spirited advice, adaptable for a wider audience. But who is this Timothy? He is a recruit to help Paul in his self-appointed mission. He is the son of a Greek father and a Jewish mother, which makes him a Jew according to Jewish law. But he was an uncircumcised Jew. To make him kosher, Paul had to have Timothy circumcised. Acts chapter 16 verse 3. In the verses under consideration, Paul advises Timothy on the subject of Scripture. The Scripture Paul is referring to is not the ones which later on became known as the Gospel according to St. Matthew, or the Gospel according to St. Mark, or the Gospel according to St. Luke, or the Gospel according to St. John. All these writings had not yet seen the light of the day. They were to follow many decades and centuries later. Paul had no inkling about them. He was referring Timothy to the Holy Scriptures with which he had been familiar from his childhood. The books of the Jews as contained in the Old Testament confirmed this from verse 15 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Since verse 16 under discussion is widely used by the Christian missionaries to prove the validity of the Holy Bible, we will use it for a test case. The verse implies that if any scripture originates from God, it will prove profitable for 1. Doctrine, teaching 2. Reproof, for convicting, rebuking, for showing people what is wrong in their lives 3. Correction, useful for correcting faults 4. Instruction unto righteousness for training and teaching us how to live correctly. I find the above four headings to categorize God's words to be very reasonable. I have been asking the Christians whether they can find a fifth heading under which the word of God can be rubricated, and in all my experience, I have not had another befitting headline. We will leave it at that. Now let us revert to that famous chapter 38 of Genesis for analysis. It is worth perusing the whole chapter so that no missionary can ever accuse you of reading his Bible out of context. What is the context? The first five verses speak about Judah and his three siblings. Judah is the father of the Jewish race from whom he derived the words Judea and Judaism. Also Judah, Hebrew Huda, also Arabic. Huda to Hudi, Yahudi, meaning Jew. Of his three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah, he gets his firstborn Ur married to a woman named Tamar. 
but verse 7 records his untimely demise. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked. Ur erred in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Holy Bible, Genesis chapter 38, verse 7. According to the standard laid down in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, to test the scripture whether it is from God, we ask our missionary friend, under which heading will you put this verse? Under 1. Doctrine, 2. Reproof, 3. Correction, or 4. Instruction unto righteousness. Our friend will not find it difficult to give the correct answer. Reproof. In effect, we learn that if we do anything wicked in the sight of God, He will destroy us. That is the moral. That is the lesson. In verse 8 of chapter 38 of Genesis, we are told that the old man Judah tells his second son Onan to go in unto his late brother's widow and beget a child from her so as to carry on the name of his deceased brother as he had died childless. The Jews were specially particular that one's name should not perish. The Bible records, And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, meaning have intercourse with her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his, that the child would not be carrying his name. And it came to pass, when he went in unto his brother's wife, that he spilled it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, wherefore he, the Lord, slew him also. Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verses 8 to 10. God killed Onan for his selfish envy. He did not want his deceased brother's name to carry on as was required by the Mosaic law. Ask your Bible thumper under which of the four headings will he put this instant retribution of God? Under doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction unto righteousness? Reproof, again, is his answer. The problem did not tax his brain. I hope that you have already framed the verse 15 to 18 as instructed. This short chapter, Genesis 38, is the choicest and spiciest piece of pornography in a book of God. Make a point of reading it a few times. Judah sends his daughter-in-law Tamar to her father's house with the promise that when his third son Shaleh was big enough to consummate the marriage, he would recall her for him to fulfill his obligation to give her a baby to perpetuate the name of her deceased husband, Ur. Judah was a superstitious person. He had reasoned that he had lost two sons already through this witch, Tamar, his daughter-in-law, and he was not prepared to risk the life of his only remaining son, Shilah, fearing lest pre-adventure he die also, as his brethren did. Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 11. Shilah is grown, and perhaps already married, but the old man is not recalling Tamar to enable her to conceive a child in the name of her late husband. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She wanted to avenge Judah's dereliction of duty. She gets the news that her father-in-law was going to Timnath to shear his sheep. She planned to waylay him. She went and sat by the wayside, knowing in her heart of heart that the old man will never pass her by without making a pass. True to tradition, Judah saw her and supposing her to be a harlot, a prostitute, a whore, he proposed to her. Come too, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee, for he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? Holy Bible, Genesis, chapter 38, verse 16. People did not carry ready cash or credit cards with them in those days. So he said that he would send her a goat kid from his flock after he had had sexual intercourse with her. Tamar was not one to be taken in by such glib talk. She had a master plan, well thought out and scientifically executed. 
She bargains. What guarantee is there for me that the goat kid would be sent? What guarantee do you want? asks Judah. Your ring, your bracelets. People used to wear bangles on their wrists those days, and the rod that you are carrying in your hand. The old man handed the things requested and cohabited with his daughter-in-law. With this single copulation she conceived, not forgetting that both her and Onan had singularly failed to impregnate Tamar. Within three months the pregnancy became apparent. Tongues began to wag. The news reached Judah that Tamar had played the harlot and was with child by Hodem. His righteous indignation knew no bounds. He ordered, Bring her forth, the bitch, and let her be burnt. Before this, she was a witch. He had lost two sons on account of her. Now she is a bitch and deserves to be burnt alive. The mad was more willy than Judah could imagine. Before she could be confronted by her father-in-law, she sent forth the ring, the bracelets and the staff, with a servant and a plea beseeching him to find out the culprit responsible for her pregnancy. She said, By the man whose these things are am I with child. Judah acknowledged his belongings and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Sheila, my surviving son, and he knew her again no more. Holy Bible, Genesis chapter 38, verse 26. Nine months after the sexual encounter on the Timnath road, between Judah the father-in-law and Tamar his daughter-in-law, the midwife was on the alert by Tamar's bedside. From the size of her abdomen, she had surmised that twins were in her womb, and according to the laws of Moses, she had to be particularly careful to label the firstborn. If the woman delivered identical twins, and if care was not taken to mark the first one to see the light of day, then grave injustice was feared because the firstborn was to receive the lion's share of his father's patrimony. While Tamar travailed, the one put out his hand through his mother's womb, and the nurse tied a scarlet thread quickly to signify that this one came out first, but this was too sensitive for the tiny trot, so he quickly withdrew his hand into the warmth of his mother, and behold, his brother came out and the midwife exclaimed, how hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez. And afterward came out his brother, that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zira. Holy Bible, Genesis chapter 38, verses 29 and 30. Perez stands for one who has jumped the queue, one who has done others out of their turn. And Zirah means red in Hebrew because he had the scarlet thread on his hand. The recurring question is, what is the moral of this biblical sexology in this famous chapter 38 of the first book of the Bible? God killed Ur, the lesson we learned was reproof. God killed Onan, the lesson again was reproof. Now Judah commits incest with Tamar and begets bastard twins who are honored to become the great-grandfathers of the only begotten Son of God. What is the moral? No moral. So it is immoral. Under what heading will you now put this filthy lewd story of a daughter-in-law entrapping her not too innocent father-in-law? Is it, number one, your doctrine, two, your reproof, three, your correction, or four, your instruction unto righteousness. Holy Bible, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. If we cannot tabulate this filth under any of the four headings to serve some purpose in a book of God, then we would be forced to invent a fifth heading. The fifth heading stares us in the face. It is pornography. Judah, the father of the Jewish race from whom we derive the word Jew, Judaism, Judea, etc., and his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and their illicit offsprings, Perez and Zirah, are immortalized in the so-called Book of God for their bastardy. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. And Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brethren. And Judah begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar. Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In every Bible that provides a cross-reference, where the words, and Judah begot Perez and Zerah of Tamar occur, the marginal note points to Genesis chapter 38, and that lewd chapter with its raunchy details. Onan also has made his mark in the Hall of Fame, Hall of Infamy. Every reputable dictionary enshrines his envious sexual perversion under the heading Onanism, the sin of Onan, coitus interruptus, derived from Onan, son of Judah. Genesis chapter 38 verse 9. Son of God or Son of Holy Ghost The Christians, in their overweening zeal to produce a genealogy for their Lord and Master Jesus, have invented two genealogies, one by St. Matthew and the other by St. Luke. Between these two lists of the ancestors of Jesus, they gave him 66 fathers and grandfathers. Of these lists, no two names are identical, except Joseph the carpenter, who can in no way be called the father of Jesus Christ, because Matthew tells us, Before they, Joseph the carpenter and Mary came together as husband and wife, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is by the Holy Ghost. Holy Bible, Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. Matthew, within three verses, confirms twice that it was the Holy Ghost who impregnated Mary. By definition, we know that in every language of the world, the one who is responsible for impregnating a woman is the actual father and not the putative supposed father. Hence, according to the unequivocal statement of Matthew, the Holy Ghost is the actual Father of Jesus and not God Almighty. The Christian world should review their theology by calling their God Jesus the Son of the Holy Ghost and not the Son of God. End of chapter 4